Let's get settled. We're very blessed tonight to have Evan speaking to us about finding God's will in our lives. So welcome to Evan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. <laughs> Good, Bashoy. How are you, David? Daniel? <laughs> All right, guys. We'll get into it. So I've been told that because you guys sit at the back, the speakers now come to you rather than you. <laughs> I guess it's easier for one person to move forward than for everyone to come, uh, to move back rather than everyone come forward. It's Mary. <laughs> All right, guys. So we're talking about finding the will of God. And I think it's one question that actually plagues a lot of young Christians. What's the will of God for my life? What should I start? Who should I marry? Is this the right job for me? And many more questions. But I don't think this is only isolated to youth. This is pretty much uh, a dilemma that many Christians face throughout their lives. Whether the decisions that they're making are actually God's will or not. So the question that we need to explore is, how can we determine whether something is the will of God? How can I know for certain that a path that I'm taking is God's will and not my own will? Can I know? Are there certain pointers I can use to have some surety to be sure about the decision that I'm making? Thank God we're not left in the dark. We have a beautiful God who loves us deeply, immensely. He's very much alive. And as his children, he has unique plans for every single one of us. So we're going to explore today some points that will allow us to grow deeper in our understanding of what God wants from each and every one of us and to be able to discern this in our lives. Now, you know the basics. So I'm not going to cover the simple thing of when you're looking for God's will, you go to Him in prayer. So the simple thing of going to the Lord and saying, Lord, I really need to know your will in this, please. Show me what your will is. That we all know, that we all do. Okay? So we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about um, dedicating some time to fasting. So saying, I'm going to fast so that I can show God that I really, really want an answer. Because these are basic things. We're going to go a little bit deeper than that, okay? And I'm presuming that you already know that. All right. So the first point is, if we want to know God's will for our life, we need to be in a a relationship with God. <clears throat> All right? I'll rewind one step. Everything that I'm saying tonight, so all the points have to come together holistically to form our search for God's will. Don't pick one and get stuck on that one. All right? All of them have to come together, but we're going to cover each one. So back to that first point. We have to have a relationship with God. This means I need to be spending time with God on a daily basis. I need to read His Word, the Bible. I need to talk to Him in prayer. And I'd like to use a nice analogy that can help us understand why the relationship with God is really important. And the analogy is the relationship between a husband and a wife, when it's done correctly, because sometimes it's not. So the husband and wife know each other very well. They share their experiences with one another. They share their feelings. They listen to one another. They spend as much time together. They love one another. The more time the husband and wife spend together, the more years that they're in this loving relationship, the greater each partner knows what their spouse wants. They know their dreams. They know their aspirations. They know when they might be upset or going through a tough time even without the other partner verbalizing their feelings. They've learned to read each other's cues and respond accordingly. So now we're going to take this analogy and bring it into our relationship with God. So God is a spirit. We can't see him or relate to him the same way we do with our spouse. That's a given. But it doesn't mean we can't get to know God because we aren't only physical beings. We're also spiritual. We have a body, soul, and spirit. 
So because we're spiritual beings, we can also have a relationship with God who is spirit. To add to that, God has given each and every one of us who are here his Holy Spirit. In other words, God is living and abiding in us. So we can know him through our spirit, the deepest part of us, and God who is in us. So let's look at it. Let's look at it, the analogy. <clears throat> All right. When the person, when any person knows, uh, loves God, they know God so well. They share every experience with God. They share their feelings with God. They listen to God through reading his word. Spend a lot of time with God throughout the day. Intimate time with God in conversation at set times of prayer and also throughout the day. They listen to God's directions and commandments and obey them. In short, this person loves God and is committed in their relationship with him. The more time this person and God spend together, the more years they're in this loving relationship, the greater the understanding expands in the individual as to what God wants from them. The deeper the love, the deeper and more intimate the union between this person and God, and thus the ability to know God. The person understands who God is experientially, through experience, through communion and union with the Lord and with his word. They are full when they've done something good, uh, up, uh, sorry, when they've done something to upset God through poor decisions. The Holy Spirit guiding them to see their errors. So even though God may not speak verbally with them, they know what he, desi what he desires from them through knowing him, through relationship, through this deep and loving communion with the Lord. They've learned to understand the guiding prompts and direction of God in the spirit in the same way that husband and wife have learned to read each other's nonverbal cues this is actually a mystery guys but it's very real and we'll go a bit deeper a person who loves God has begun the journey of having God come and dwell in them very powerfully as we see in the lives of the Saints a journey of union with the Lord and in our tradition this is called as theosis all right, and I'll explain what that means because it can be misunderstood and that can lead to heresy. But there is, that is in our tradition. St. Cyril talks about it a lot, so we'll talk about it. Our Lord says in John chapter 14, verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. When we obey God, when we love God, when we've got this deep relationship with God, He comes and dwells in us very powerfully, guys, very powerfully. Bishop Yusuf from the United States, um, the Bishop from the United States on, his, on the Suscops website, um, has given us a few definitions on what theosis means so we can understand it correctly. So I'll read that out and then I'll read how that relates to what we're talking about, okay? So this is from the website. Theos Theosis or deification means union with God, taken from the Greek word theos, which is God, and the other Greek word enosis, which is union, theosis. Yeah? Our Lord Jesus Christ asked God the Father they also, that they also may be one in us. John chapter 17 verse 21. He also, uh, I'll skip that part so we don't spend two hours here tonight. Our Full union with God is a union with the energies, also known as the grace of God. These energies, while an extension of God, are not to be confused with the essence of God. So we're not joining with God and losing our existence, where I cease to be Evan, and you cease to be Beshoy, and somehow we are fused into God. No. But we experience a union through the grace of God, through the Holy Spirit that is in us, and as... Uh, uh, Bishop Yusuf continues, Our union with God will not make us gods, but will make us partners in the divine nature in works, not in essence. We will not acquire the unique characteristics of God, such as being creator, omnipotent, meaning being all-powerful, or omnipresent, being everywhere present, but it will make us partners with him in building the kingdom by our own salvation and winning the soul of others to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So what does that mean? In short, in summary, 
Theosis is a union with God through the Holy Spirit, through a total heartfelt commitment to God in love that transforms us and allows us to overcome our fallen nature, it's the stains of sin and the sinful ways that we have and allows us to become Christ-like, full of virtues through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's get back to our talk. If we've progressed in our journey of theosis, becoming partakers of the divine nature, if we have God living and abiding in us, then we can truly know God and know his will for us on a very deep level. Because he's in us. An example of this is one of the great modern saints of our church, Baba Krolos. Yeah? This man had amazing insight. He knew God's will for each person. He knew each person's thoughts. He could tell you your future. He, he was so filled with the Spirit of God that he had put on the mind of Christ. And therefore, through this union with the Lord in love, he knew the will of God, not only for himself, but for each individual that came to him. All right. Moving on. A lot of people will say, yeah, but I'm not Baba Krolos, right? That's why I said, listen to the rest of the points. Because ultimately, we should all be on the same journey that he had. What do I mean by that? He wasn't Baba Krolos when he was 13, 14 years old, like some or you guys are a bit older. But you get my point. It took years of relationship, love for God, yearning for God, thirsting for God, before he got to that point. It didn't mean that he had to wait to get to that point to know God's will. He knew it far clearer when he was filled with the presence of God and loved him with all his being at an older age because he had more years in his relationship with God. But nonetheless, because he was on that journey from a very young age, as we should all be, he had the rest of these pointers to help him along the way. I can't stress the importance on this journey of reading the Bible daily. A Christian who doesn't know his Bible well is like a person that's blindfolded trying to go about their normal daily activities. So imagine you wake up in the morning, you've got to go to work, and you're blindfolded, or to school or to anything. Yeah. A person like that's going to make so many errors, they're going to be walking around in darkness, and they're not going to be able to make it to the end of the day without doing significant damage to themselves and to other people. In the exact same way, a Christian who doesn't read the Bible daily and doesn't know the scriptures is spiritually blind. They don't know God's commandments, so they can't obey them. They don't know how God deals with us, his infinite love, mercy and compassion. They don't know Jesus deeply and his, word, his, his words, so they live like everyone else in the world. They set up their own God their own way of life, their own way of living, because they don't have God's words as their number one, and satisfy their own conscience according to their own gospel. When I pray a little bit, then I've prayed today, thank God, I've done my prayers. But if I don't say our Father before I lie down, oh, no, no, I've got to say my prayers, so I'll just say a quick our Father and I feel okay. That's the gospel of this world, not the gospel of Christ. You've made your own gospel. The person who reads the word of God daily will realize that's not what God wants from us. They'll come to know God. All right. As I said, the person who isn't reading the scriptures daily is going to make countless errors. They won't be able to make it to the end of their lives without doing significant damage to themselves and to others, like the blindfolded person. They're spiritually blind. And therefore, not only will they lead themselves to a dark place, but because they aren't gathering in people to Christ, they're scattering abroad, as the Lord said, and therefore they're leading others also to darkness. Because either you're with Christ or you're not. And I don't mean with Christ just because you named the Christian, but that you love him. You love him deeply. Yeah? Very important. These sort of people that don't read their Bible daily daily are also really greatly shaken if a really persuasive speaker challenges their faith. They may not know the scriptures, they don't know their faith well, so someone who's very well read, an intellectual athe atheist or maybe an agnostic, will come here 
and start talking to them or meet them on the street and give them an argument that they don't know how to respond to. And because they're, they're not built on a foundation, they've built their house on sand, the waves come, knock down the house, and the whole structure falls. Whereas those who read the Word of God daily and do everything else that our relationship with God entails have a strong foundation and aren't shaken by anyone that comes along with an argument that seems persuasive because they know their faith. Thus, we need to be committed to our study of the Scriptures daily as a life commitment, not as a few weeks after this talk as you get psyched up for life. Yeah? All right, we've spoken about prayer before so I'm not going to dwell on it too much but I have to say shortly that without a committed prayer life it's extremely difficult for a person to know God's will without a committed prayer life it's impossible to make spiritual progress or even start the journey of theosis of becoming Christ like impossible let us not fool ourselves and when I say committed Committed prayer life, as I said, it's not that our Father before we go to sleep. It's spending a beautiful, loving time with the Lord. Where you talk to Him, you thank Him, you glorify Him. You've got time set apart where you love God and show Him that through your conversation with Him. Through pouring your heart out before Him. Very important. And if we haven't gotten to the stage where our relationship with God is one of love, one of thanksgiving, one of gratitude, it'll come. But it's not going to just fall out of the sky if we're not putting in the effort to first have the normal relationship. In the same way, you meet someone, they're your friend. You don't love them straight away. You get to know them, you talk to them, you establish a relationship. With time, if you put the effort in, then there's the warmth, then there's the beauty of that deep, beautiful friendship. Same as a relationship, yeah? Same with God. It takes time, guys. We have to put in the effort. All right, moving on. Next point. Throughout all this that I've talked about, when I know something is the will of God, I need to do it. For example, God's will is that I forgive my enemies. Yeah? Turn the other cheek. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. We know it. It's in His Word. Since I know this is the will of God, I have to obey it. I can't say to God, Lord, I want to know who I should marry. Reveal the this to me, I want to know your will, or I need to know, Lord, is this the job you want me to have? While at the same time I'm saying to God, I know it's your will for me to forgive my enemies, I don't want to do it. I want to do my will. Why should God answer my questions and reveal to me his will when it's unknown to me? I don't know that particular thing that I'm asking for. When I know his will clearly in other areas, but I don't want to listen to it or obey it. If we want to know God's will, we need to obey and remain faithful to His will when it's made known to us through Scripture or through other means. This allows us to prove to God that our intention is right and that we will be sincere in obeying His will once He reveals it. All right, so we get that. Obedience to God is important if we want Him to make His will clear to us. Very important. Next point. We need to seek advice from other godly people. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14, we read, Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Where there's no counsel, where there's no advice, where I do whatever I think is right, people fall. In the multitude of counselors, there's safety. When I seek advice, when I ask three or four godly people, what do you think about that? this what do you think on this matter it's an important matter and I get advice from others they may help me see something I haven't seen there's safety in that the scriptures say that Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it because all of us Guys, we're living in a fallen world. We aren't at the level of Baba Karolos yet. We're on our journey, which means sometimes we're angry, sometimes we're proud, sometimes we're selfish. 
We're stained through the brokenness of sin. What that means is, is that I can't simply trust my heart because my heart's not pure yet. My heart is stained by many different passions, whether it's ego, whether it's selfishness, whether it's pride. So if I'm going to listen to my own heart, I may be listening to something that isn't from God, but stained by a fall, right? Even if we think God has revealed something to us, of course, if it's something revealed clearly in Scripture, I obey it. Like not stealing or lying, it's black and white, yeah? But if it's something unclear, and I know I keep using this example because it's around your age, I guess, but um, for example, is this person suitable to be my partner? Yeah? I can't just follow my heart and my own understanding on this matter. Our heart is stained by sin. It's not a reliable guide. Unless we're at the level of the saints. But because we're on a journey, we have to be careful. I'll give you an example. A young person could be really attracted to someone. They may pray to God to reveal his will. Dear Lord, reveal your will. Is it your will for me to be with this person? But because the attraction is so strong, it blurs the signs that God is giving to this person, making it clear this person is not right for you. But because the emotion is so strong, they're blind to this. And if they're going to follow their heart in this instance, they're going to make a very bad decision and can have long-lasting consequences, really painful, long-lasting consequences. This is where it's really good to seek advice from godly people, people we can see, love God and have a relationship with Him and know us. Yeah? And our first stop, of course, would be who? After praying to the Lord and seeking His will, spiritual Father. We can reveal to our spiritual Father, I believe that God has made His will clear and that God wants me to be with this person and I want to proceed in my relationship with them. The confession Father can see without the blurring of my emotions and can sometimes give a better judgment on the matter sometimes can give a better judgment on the matter. Other godly servants can also be approached if we have questions or need guidance, not only on marriage. Yeah? We are not alone, guys. We're part of a church. Jesus did not come to save individuals. Jesus came and created a community, a church. And because we're part of the body of Christ, we're not alone in our decisions, in seeking um, in our journey of life. And therefore, it's really good to get advice from others who have progressed on that journey of holiness. Yeah? All right, next point. It's important to consider what talents has God given me? What unique talents do I have compared to someone else? For example, if you're five foot tall, it may not be a realistic goal to aim to be a professional center in the NBA. Because centers are about seven foot tall. It's not going to work, right? St. Peter says in the first epistle of St. Peter, chapter 4, verse 10, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As each one has received a gift. Everyone's got a gift. And we need to find these unique gifts to fulfill the will of God in our lives in areas where those gifts are concerned. I'll give you an example. I might be a really good listener, have a lot of empathy. People might feel comfortable when they tell me their problems. They feel consolation because I listen well and I've got that nature. God has given me the opportunity to have these gifts. So in my pursuit to find God's, God's will for my life, I can explore how am I going to use these talents, how am I going to use these gifts in a positive way to help others. I can be a psychologist, I can be a counsellor, I can be a social worker. I've got certain gifts and talents. I shouldn't put them to the side. But how has God blessed me and why has he given me these gifts? On the contrary, I could be an introvert. I could be socially uncomfortable, prefer a few close friends. I may be brilliant with numbers, love mathematics and be amazing at problem solving. I don't think it's a good idea to be a social worker if you've got that personality. It doesn't fit your gifts and talents that God has given you. But you'd Seek a career perhaps in data analysis or other similar roles. Looking at what gifts God has given you. God, as I said, has given us unique talents. If we prayerfully explore all these talents with God, God will open up paths and uh, show us how we can serve Him better and our neighbor. Alongside this, remember, 
all the points. It's not one point. All of them come together as a whole. Next one. I need to keep a keen eye on doors that God may open and close in my life. And I'll explain what that means. For example, I may be looking for a particular job or career path. I could be praying for God's guidance. I could be a faithful servant. And I can genuinely love God, but I'm set on this career. I really want this career. Study, whatever it might be. I then notice that several other servants or friends from church say to me, I don't think you're really suited to that. I think that you'd be better in this particular field. I ignore them. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't like what you're saying. I'm really passionate about this. I apply over and over again without success. I can't get the job. On the other hand, others continue to keep recommending this other area. My spiritual father says the same thing. You'd really suit this role. It's something different from what I want. I'm still not convinced. I have my heart set on what I want. I then receive an email from a friend that has an, a link for an advertised position on the role that everyone's been telling me about. What am I going to do? Am I going to ignore it completely, tell everyone to mind their own business and say, no, I want to do what I want? Or am I going to put it to prayer? Am I going to come to God and say, Lord, you know that I'm passionate and I wanted this job. But everyone's been telling me about this other role. My spiritual father's told me, and now all of a sudden someone sent me a link. Lord, I'm going to pursue this. If it's your will, open the doors and let it go smoothly. If not, stop it. Yeah, and I continue. I end up getting the job. I love it. It's perfect. And I realized that God had a plan for me. And that if I was careful on looking at what doors God opens and closes, I would have seen that and followed that. Yeah? All right. So we've covered several points. I'm going to summarize them. Number one, I need to have a deep and committed relationship with God if I'm going to know his will. This includes daily Bible reading so I can know the will of God that's been clearly revealed in the scriptures, regular participation in the holy mysteries. I left that out because it's a given. You need to have communion. You need to be confessing. These are the basics. If I do all of this with a deep love for God, God comes and dwells in me powerfully. I start the journey of theosis, this union with the Lord through the grace of God, where I become Christ-like in virtue. I don't become God. I become Christ-like in virtue. And through the Holy Spirit dwelling in me powerfully, I come to know the, mo the mind of the Lord. I put on the mind of Christ, like the great saints in our church. Next one. If I know something is God's will, I need to obey it. It's pointless to seek God's will in a matter that is unclear when I know his will in another area, clearly revealed in Scripture, but I'm not going to listen to it. Number three, we need to seek counsel. Don't trust your own heart. We're all beginners on our spiritual journey. Even if we've made some progress, we need to seek advice from people that are more experienced than us. Number four, take into consideration the unique gifts that God has given you. Don't put them to the side and just seek a career for reasons that might be economic or whatever it might be. God has given you gifts. Use those gifts to his glory. While doing all the above, I need to keep my eyes open for doors that God may be opening or closing. That's it. Now, someone might say to me, Evan, that's great. All right? What happens if I have a pressing decision to make and I need to know God's will now? Well, hopefully before getting to this point of having to make this decision, you've been doing all the above. You love God with all your heart. You take your relationship with God seriously. And if you're doing all that and you follow these five points... I think it was five. God will make his will clear. He'll reveal it. Yeah? If not, and we haven't been taking our relationship with God seriously, then it's time to start. There's no shortcut. We have to start doing all we can to love God, to have this beautiful relationship with him. Pray hard, seek counsel, repent, and do all the above points. If we do everything that we can, guys, in our relationship with God, and all those above-mentioned points, God will guide us through his Holy Spirit and make his will clear to us. He will. Because he loves us and doesn't want to leave us in the dark. The question I need to ask myself is, am I doing my part in my relationship with God so that I can know him and know his will for my life? If so, the answers will come very clearly. And now questions.
Thanks, Evan, for that. Um, so my question, I guess, is we always say, you know, let it be according to God's will, and we're always focused on that. But I, I guess what are practical ways of actually doing it in our daily lives? So not just saying it, but practically thinking it as well. I'm just going to get a Bible verse that's really going to help with this answer. I think it's Philippians chapter 4. And then we're going to open that up and talk about it. It's not Philippians chapter 4. Sorry guys, I will find it. easier if I just get it. I've saved it on my phone as an image because I liked it so much. Uh -huh. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16 to 18. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what was your question again? <laughs> Okay. Okay, and you were saying, how do we remember to do that? So we're all seeking to implement the will of God in our lives to, in other words, have this unceasing relationship with God where we're trying as best as we can to do what God wants. Is that what you mean? Okay. There's this beautiful verse, guys, that um, I actually love very much, and it's a famous verse, and it's uh, you can look it up. It's First Thessalonians chapter 5. 16, 17, and 18. So it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. St. Paul is saying here, these things that I'm telling you, it's the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He's telling a new church that has just come to uh, the Christian faith to pray without ceasing. And he's giving them the means whereby they can enter into this unceasing communion with God. And if you are in a state of prayer, in unceasing prayer, the natural consequence of that is that you are in an unceasing relationship talking to God. Therefore, his grace is empowering you to obey his commandments to love, to sacrifice, and to do all these things. Now, how do you do this? He says, rejoice always. So there's joy in this. And he also says, in everything give thanks. One of the things that's really lacking, I think, uh, from what I've seen in uh, our church today, is there isn't really joy. And perhaps that joy doesn't exist because we don't really approach our relationship with God right. Our relationship with God is a bunch of rules. And if I follow these rules and I do these prayers and I do this stuff, then I'm okay with God and my conscience is okay and therefore I can go to sleep. Let's take that perspective and put it into our relationship, husband and wife. If I listen to her, if I do the chores, if I do that, then sweet, it's okay. Would that make you happy as a wife or a husband? Or do you want your partner to love you, to spend time, to enjoy each other? This is what God wants from us. And God is giving us here, guys, the means whereby we can do that. I'll give you an example. Modern psychologists today have found that when a person lives a life of gratitude, they are unbelievably happy. St. Paul just said it there. <laughs> Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. 
He's put them all together. That if I start to realize and use the gift of thanksgiving in my daily life at different times, I enter into this beautiful joy through the grace of God and it enables me to pray unceasingly. What do I mean by that? For example, I get up to, to go to work in the morning and I say, thank you, Lord, that you've given me another day. I'm not talking about standing up and praying. That's separate. I mean during the day. I go to get in my car and I say, dear Lord, thank you so much that I've got a car and I can go to work when others have to walk. And I feel joy that God has blessed me with that. I have my breakfast. Thank you, Lord, that I've got food to eat when others don't. I ask all of you to try this. Try it for a week. Try in every circumstance to find how can I thank God. Is there something I can thank God about here? Thank you, Lord, that at work I've got a computer screen. It makes my job so much easier to, to have that and to have a quick computer rather than have to do everything manually. When we start to have this, uh, this idea of gratitude, it transforms our whole life. Instead of us being bogged down in the boringness, the mundaneness of life, we start to realize how blessed we are. And that gratitude leads to praise. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. Thank you that I can come to church with my brothers and sisters and enjoy fellowship. Thank you, Lord, that I've got clothes to wear. So what St. Paul is saying, that by giving thanks in everything, I learn to pray without ceasing, and it leads to joy. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. This is a very simple and practical way, because it's joyful. It's not one of sorrow, it's not one of depression, it's not one of being down, it's joy. And as I said, guys, look it up, Google it. Modern psychology is telling people, do this. You'll hear about the 20-day gratitude challenge. And they don't believe in God. <laughs> but they've realized that by being grateful, it transforms their perspective on life. Ultimately, again, I'm, I'm reiterating this, St. Paul wasn't talking to monastics. This is a new church. And he's saying, pray without ceasing. There's un believable power in being in communion and union with Lord through prayer throughout the day. Because I cannot become a saint, I cannot grow in virtue, I cannot grow in love, I cannot grow in humility, forgiveness or any of this through my own power. It's all through the grace of God. And how do I access that grace? Prayer having my mind and my heart on Him. And think about it. Who doesn't want to be happy? He wants to be happy. I want to be happy. He wants to have joy. We all want to have joy. Practical means. Very practical means. Every opportunity, and look for the opportunities. Don't wait for them to come to you, to be thankful. And you'll see the difference that it makes by having gratitude. Huge, huge difference. Does anyone disagree? Will anyone try it? I really want you to try it because I'm telling you, the grace, look guys, think, think of it this way. God loves us beyond anything we can even begin to comprehend. He loves us enough that he sent his son to die for us, to give us life. And we don't understand it yet, but I'm going to be a father soon, and I've heard from a lot of parents, when they see their child come into the world, they realize, oh my gosh, I love this little thing so much, out of nowhere I've got this amazing love, this amazing emotion, then it clicks with that person, if I love this child so much, imagine how much God loves me. Yeah? So if God loves us so much, and he wants us to be saved, why don't I tap into this understanding of this love of God, this mercy of God, this amazing compassion of God, and make my relationship with God one of joy. Don't get me wrong, we're sinners. Of course we're sinners. But how beautiful to repent and to have joy. To be joyful, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your compassion. Even though I'm broken, even though I'm wretched, instead of being, oh, miserable, I'm down like this, and then because of the sorrow, you become heavy, you become unable to live life with joy. You get bogged down because Christ doesn't 
don't want us to be sorrowful because he knows mercy is available. Repent. Why are you in that state for? Again, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. I assure you, Bashar, if we try and do this, it will transform our relationship with God. It will transform our relationship with others. It will make us look at life positively. It will affect our workplace, everything. Because God will be with us and in us in a powerful way. Next question. Thank you. How, how can you diagnose a superficial spiritual life? Because you, it might not be hard to come to the Mass, confession, even read the Bible every day with just good time management and not much else. Relationship. It all comes down to relationship. If I have my spiritual life as tick box, I set my time for, for, for Bible reading, tick. I set my time for prayer, tick, tick, tick. I feel good now. Again, I take it back to the analogy of husband and wife. How would you feel if your, your husband approached his relationship with you as ticks? I spent some time with her today, tick, very good. I listened to her today, tick, very good. I bought her some, uh, some flowers, tick. You're going to think, what? That's not love. You're just trying to make, satisfy your conscience. You're trying to just make sure you're doing the right things. That's not relationship. With God, guys, it's not about ticking the boxes. It's love. It's a relationship of love. And, we, and it takes effort. To, to get into this mode of it not being, oh, you know what, it's, it's, I don't feel nothing. I pray, I don't feel anything. I come to church, I don't feel anything. That's all right. It'll come. Persist. But change your perspective. Where, are you deep, deeply grateful for what God has given you? Do you use the tools that God's given us to enter into that joy? Are you doing your part? Or... Are you just sad all the time? You're down because of your sins. And because of that, you feel heavy. You feel tired. You pray. You don't have energy. Church has become a drag. Because I'm just a sinner. I'm broken. How can I have joy? Wrong perspective. It's going to take us a lifetime if, if we get to the point where we have no sin. Christ didn't come to save perfect people. He came to save sinners. If that's the case, I need to have joy here and now. The early Christians, you know how they were recognized? This is written down in the writings of people that were not Christian. You know how they were recognized? Joy. Were early Christians uh, at the level of sainthood already? No. They had faith. They believed in the Lord. They believed, oh my gosh, I'm a child of God now. They had sins, they had weaknesses, but they rejoiced, they repent, and they trusted in God's love. They trusted in His mercy. We need to enter this joy. But again, it takes effort on our part. Sometimes, guys, it feels amazing. Sometimes God will give extra grace, and you'll feel full of joy and happiness and peace, and sometimes He won't. It's in those moments where I turn to the tools God's given me, gratitude. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And not, I'm not saying just in the morning when you say your Thanksgiving prayer. Throughout the day, find opportunities to be grateful for what God has given you and rejoice in the Lord. Again, this is one verse. I'd like you, when you go home, look up all the verses on joy. On joy in the scripture. Meditate on that. Rejoice. Again, I say to you, rejoice. Joy gives a lot of strength. So to answer your question, relationship. Don't make your relationship with God tick boxes. Make your relationship with God a relationship of love. Enjoy God. And if you don't know how to do that, put in the effort into finding out, how do I do that? How do I enjoy God? Lord, I want to enjoy you. I don't want my relationship to be a drag with you. I don't want to have this miserable relationship where my Christian life is boring and I'm not happy and I'm just empty Lord teach me how am I to have your joy fill me with your joy help me to grow deeper in my life 
for you? You think he's not going to answer? Of course he will. Keep knocking. Keep asking. The Lord will answer and do our part. Next question. Um, you said that, that a Christian that doesn't read the Bible is blindfolded, right? What if I struggle to read the Bible and like, I'm not good at like, I just don't enjoy reading and I, I don't know where to start. Every time I've given it a shot, I've tried to start somewhere and I've realised, okay, I've read this, I've read the beginning of Matthew about 20 times and I'm, like, I'm not getting anywhere. So I don't, I don't know where to go with it. I feel like I'm not really getting anything. I'm like, I'm reading stories, but I'm not getting anything out, anything out of it. And I just don't enjoy reading, so I just give up. So if I'm going in to start again, where would you recommend that I start in the Bible where I'd really get the biggest benefit? All right, beautiful question and very important and very relevant. First thing, what is the Bible to us? This is very important. The Bible is God's love letter to humanity. It is literally God's love letter to humanity. The story of humanity constantly rebelling against God, constantly doing God's heading, if you want to use our language, yet God constantly trying to bring them back to the path of salvation, constantly trying with prophets, with every means, to the point where... He does the ultimate and sends his only begotten son that he can die for us, restore us, heal us and save us. So my understanding of the scriptures has to be this is a book of life. This not just a normal book. This isn't just a normal saint book or a normal book. This is God's word. This is God's love letter to me. Not only to the church, to me. So if I understand that this is God's love letter to me, it will change my perspective of reading the scriptures. That's the first point. The second point, let's say I understand that, but it's still it's, it's a bit hard. Never try in the spiritual life to do more than what you're capable at this point in time. What do I mean by that? I'm new to my spiritual life. I read the Baba Karolos used to wake up at four in the morning and spend hours I was in prayer, so I think, you know what, I'm really zealous, I'm excited, I'm going to do that. Some people do that. Others are on the opposite extreme. Never try and do more than what you're capable of, because you're going to burn out and then you're going to give up altogether. So you do what you're capable of. What that means is, is that if I know that I'm not into reading, I know that it's God's love letter to me, I know how beautiful it is, I know how amazing it is, I'm not a reader, I don't enjoy reading, I don't feel I'm getting anything from it. All right, what I need to do is, is have a simple plan where I can maintain that as a lifelong goal, as a lifelong practice. So if I'm, excuse me, if I'm going to say to you, you have to read the Bible every day for the rest of your life, and then you're going to try and read six, seven, ten passages a day every day, you're going to burn out eventually, you're going to give up. But if I said to you, all right, read one chapter a day, just one chapter, a day, F five to ten minutes if you read it slowly. It makes it easier, doesn't it? it makes it easier because you're not reading ten, you're reading one chapter. So I set a realistic goal for myself and say, all right, no matter what happens, no matter if I'm lazy, no matter if I'm tired, no matter if I'm fresh, whatever it might be, I'm going to read this one chapter every day regardless whether I feel it, whether I don't. The natural consequence of that is, is that in 365 days, I've read 365 chapters. In three years, I've read over a thousand. You get the idea. Ten years, twenty years, so on. After a year of reading the scriptures every day, the natural consequence of that is you're going to understand the Word of God better. Doesn't mean you're going to be a biblical scholar. You're going to know it better. You'll have a better understanding of the parables. A lot of things won't make sense. That's okay. The Bible's a living book. You pick the the most holy monk and they'll tell you that every time I read it I get something new no matter how old they are they can be 80 every time they read it they get something new so I don't feel like you're going to understand it all in one hit that's natural but if I make it a goal that I'm going to read it every day the natural consequence of that is 
this, that as I also progress in holiness, today I'm one person, but I'm loving God, I'm praying every day, I'm trying to have this beautiful relationship with God. In a year, I'm a very different person. I may not see it, because God, this is the other thing, God hides the spiritual progress from us. He hides our own spiritual progress. Why? He doesn't want us to be proud. So we can't see it. But because I'm progressing deeper in Christ and I'm stripping away a little bit more pride, a little bit more anger, a little bit more ego, not all of it, that's a lifelong journey. But if I'm genuine in my love for God, I'm getting holier. The natural consequence of that is because I'm getting let rid of more darkness, pride, ego, selfishness, slowly, slowly, the light of Christ can shine in and help me to understand the scriptures better with time. Again, a year's past. I'm taking my, my relationship with God seriously. I read a chapter a day. Two years pass. Three, four, five. Eventually what happens is you, you're growing in Christ. Even though stuff hasn't made sense, because you've been reading it, it's stored in here like a memory bank. So as you progress deeper in Christ, all of a sudden, as the Holy Spirit starts to fill us more with his presence, all this stuff that I've read comes to life. It makes sense now. I understand it now. But I put in the effort. For those five years where I was still struggling and it didn't make sense, I read a chapter a day and I did it faithfully. So in five years' time, all of a sudden the scripture is making sense because I'm putting away my sins and weaknesses, and Christ can reveal more of the scriptures to me. So the goal is, guys, many times we're not going to feel to pray. I can sit here and say how amazing the relationship with God is, and it's sweet, and gratitude, and thanksgiving, and love, love and all these beautiful things, but not everyone's going to feel that. It takes time. Our goal is to try. And we're guaranteed that if you try with time, you're going to get there. But don't give up because you haven't gotten there yet. Don't stop. Remain faithful to the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Have that gratitude. Read the Bible, even one chapter a day. I guarantee you, if you do it one chapter a day, as time passes, you're going to want to read more. That one chapter will become two. As the years pass, the two will become three. To the point where when you have some spare time, you want to read the Bible didn't start like that. The spiritual journey doesn't start where you're at the end. Holiness, baby steps. But am I doing the baby steps? If I do, you're on the right path. Just don't give up. Which chapter? You're not going to like my answer, Matthew. <laughs> Look, I, I, I always say to, to people, read at least twice the New Testament before you jump into the Old. I might be wrong. That's my, my experience. Because the New Testament is telling us everything about the beauty of who Christ is. So is the Old, but it takes time for you to see that. <laughs> the Old Testament is all about Christ. But if I say, where's Christ in the Old Testament, we're going to say, oh, I don't know. So leave that. Time will come. New Testament. Understand it. Once, twice, maybe three times. Then go to the Old. Any time you're reading the Scriptures, something doesn't makes sense and you've got the time, write the question down. Even better, Lord, what does this mean? Watch the miracle. Dear Lord, what does this mean? I don't understand this. You get in the car, you'll be driving to work, you've got one way 3.2 on and the guy answers what that means, for example. Or you put on a sermon, you start listening to it and Abuna answers the question that you have. Why? God wants to give us answers. God wants to minister to our hearts. Bring him into the, your Bible reading. Every time you pray, dear Lord, help me understand the scriptures. Am I going to understand it? Broken, fallen, Evan, good luck. But Evan with God, even though he's broken and fallen, very powerful. Because it's God, not Evan. Bring God into your reading as well. So yeah, Matthew, and if you, you've done chapter 1 about 30 times, start on chapter 2. It's all right. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Don't be shy. Yes. Um, so
so in our life sometimes there are like stressful moments like we might have like for example we study something and we get very stressed and it becomes hard to pray like you find yourself unable to speak because you're so full of stress like how can you overcome that very good question um, and that uh, doesn't only relate to stress it relates to many things in life so one person it's going to be stress another person it's going to be work another person it's going to be facing parenthood another person and you get the picture. So in life, uh, we live in a fallen world, and whether it's studies or whatever it might be, we're going to face things that really challenge us and make life difficult. All right. Uh, we have to identify first, guys, that if we're finding that we have a lot of stress, uh, whatever that might be, that we have to find ways practically to deal with that. Yeah. In the same way that if and I'm one of these people, I have been and I'm working on it, by disposition, I'm what you call a melancholic person. Droopy, down all the time. You may not see it, but that's what I've been for many years and I have to challenge myself and bring myself to joy. Someone might be by disposition a bit anxious, always on the edge, always a bit stressed. We have to work on these things. So if I see, for example, that by nature I stress out a lot, yeah, and don't think if if you are one of these people, don't feel bad about it. Most people have either one or the other. It's humanity. Yeah. Um, do some research into ways of calming yourself down, and you might think, oh, what's that got to do with Christ? These are practical things that God has given us. For example, if I'm a stress head, take a little bit of time to get into nature. Walk and sit in the backyard for a bit. Listen to the wind. Spend some time in God's creation and look at how God has created his creation in such a way that it soothes my soul. It brings me back with prayer to a pace of peacefulness. If I'm really stressed, sometimes I have to stop for that moment. Breathe. Very basic things. One of the natural things that happens when you're stressed out or when you're anxious is your, your breathing speeds up. You don't realize it. You take shorter breaths. You don't realize it, but it happens. And that's why normal counseling for that sort of thing is focus on your breathing. Breathe in slowly from your nose, breathe out. It sounds silly, right? Because it's not a Christian thing, but it is, isn't it? Because God made us, and God made us to function normally, so there's things that are within science that can help with that. Also, apart from from the worldly things that psychology tells us. Get into nature. Learn to calm yourself. Focus on your breathing. We've got the added bonus on top of all of that. We know Christ. And there's no greater power than that. I need to try and bring myself to the point in my spiritual life where I realize that regardless of what happens, I'm in God's hands. All right, I don't get the best mark. So what? Did I put my effort in to get the best mark? It's fine. It takes time, but I have to get my, myself to this place in, God, in my relationship with God where, okay, if something doesn't go the way I wanted, so what? I'm passing through this world. This isn't my home. My home is in heaven. This is just a temporary journey. Why in the world am I going to stress out of things in this world when I don't belong here? <laughs> I belong in the next. Of course, what I'm saying in theory is very easy. In practice, it's different. This is why St. Paul says um, to try and renew our minds in Christ, to put on a new mind, to put away this mind of the world and put on the mind of Christ. I need to trust in the Lord. Okay, I've got a lot of pressure on me. Life is stressful. I'll do my best. I'm going to take a break. I'm not going to push myself to breaking point. Go for a walk in the park. Enjoy. Enjoy God's creation. Try the great the gratitude. Look, look at the beautiful creation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that I've got eyes to see the beauty of your creation. Thank you that I can feel on my skin the wind. It brings peace to your soul when you enter into the presence of God. Basic things, very basic things. If you're like me and you're one of the sad people in melancholic disposition, as I said, joy, gratitude, thanksgiving. There's tools that God has given us, guys. Trusting in God, 
God's love, trusting in his mercy, taking time out and realizing it doesn't matter. I don't need to worry about this life. What's the verse? Everyone knows it. It's sad. I don't know where I know the scriptures but I don't know where they are <laughs> but I don't know this one by heart so I'll find it so I'm just googling it guys This one was the one in Philippians. Philippians 4, 6. Sorry, I know I talk a lot, but nearly done. All right. Be, uh, Philippians 4, 6, guys. a good scripture to memorize. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Again, listen, with thanksgiving. It's there every time. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Thanksgiving. Do you see it? Modern psychology is confirming what the scriptures teach. In other words, you're anxious, you're stressed out. Come to God in prayer with thanksgiving. Thank him for the blessings you've got. Take some time. Time out, go for a walk, enjoy the creation of God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guide your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Memorize it, guys. It's so good. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. I hope that helped a little bit. Any other questions, guys? I love questions. If you have more, I'll stay here all night. <laughs> if not, I'll go home. It's all right. <laughs> I think that's it. Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evan. A beautiful talk. We all need to know God's will in our life. And can I ask you something, guys? Now we started the Great Land, so it's a beautiful time of the year, the Holy Great Fast. Beautiful time of the year for us to really use the fasting and opportunity and the spirituality of that period to really get close to God, as Evan said, through the prayer and the different means that was discussed tonight. This is really how we're going to hear God's word. If you want to hear God's will, if you want to, if you want to hear what Evan want to tell me, I have to get closer to Him and give him my ear to be able to hear him. This is the time of the year, guys. Get close to God. Get stuck to God. We have extra masses. Every day there's more than one liturgy. Make an effort to attend one of them during the week. Don't just rely on Sunday. Sunday is a, is a big festival, you know. Try and attend one of quiet masses during the week to really get the benefit. Not to come on Sunday and showing off and everyone showing off to too noisy and all that stuff. Just come really purely to pray a liturgy. You know, if you haven't started fasting, don't say it's only preparation week. It's a fasting. I'm start from next week. No, the church did that week for us to start fasting this week. Don't make your own rules when it comes to fasting. Seek advice before you do anything different. Use this time, guys. Do not waste this time, opportunity, the best time of the year to get close to the God and truly really make that uh, advancement, progress in our spiritual life as, as we sit today. Thank you so much, Evan. Beautiful.